Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I will talk, actually I was a bit afraid. I, uh, the first uh, slide was to justify why I'm here because the topic is a bit um, orthogonal to the conference, but actually non commutative geometry has been introduced just to talk before. So I feel less uh, guilty, so to say, to be here. Uh, no, it's not a question of guilt, but okay. So the work I would like to present is uh, talk about this non commutative, non -commutative geometry that we have just heard a little bit about, and more specifically about the, the metric aspect. So there is a distance formula, which is a distance between probability distribution actually, and uh, we will see, okay, that this distance is related to some distance in optimal transport, and we will see that there was a, a question about, you know, in optimal transport, there are various formulation of the distance, and there are dual formulation, and to see how this works in, uh, in the context and in the non-commutative framework. So, uh, most of the results here are made in collaboration with uh, Francesco D'Andrea from Naples. So, let me give uh, just a few words, because I assume that uh, maybe the audience is not very familiar with non-commutative geometry. So usually what people uh, intend in the most uh, common sense of non-commutative geometry is the idea that it is a space where the coordinates no longer commute, okay? Uh, there are various models of this kind, uh, and doing that you can make some deformation or either Euclidean or Lorentzian uh, spaces, and for instance here I've, plot, I'm, I've written several kind of uh, deformation that you can have. So if, the, if this is the commutator of the coordinates, so you can ask that it is no longer zero, for instance, it is a constant, or you can ask that it is a kind of Lie algebraic uh, deformation. So here, these are constant, okay? And so the commutator of two coordinate xt and xu is now given proportional to the lambda coordinate, which is this one. And we, when you do this, of course, the coordinates are no longer function, like the coordinate function on the manifold, but they became operator. And by doing this, actually, you are losing a lot of uh, geometrical stuff, and most of all, you are losing the very important notion of points and uh, distance between points, okay? Because if you say now that the, the space is described by this kind of operators, what are the points in this framework, okay? So there are various definition. If you want to be fancy, you can say this is quantum points or stuff like that. But if you look at many of the model, uh, actually most of them, uh, even if you can define some kind of analogous of points, you don't have the notion of distance. This is something that you are losing. At best, what you can have is an operator which, uh, which be a length, length operator. So for instance, here you mimic the, um, the Euclidean distance. So if you, if you now are operator, and if this operator are well behaved, you can take the square of them, the sum and take the square root. I mean, this is well defined. So there are some models like the, uh, in this framework of quantum space-time, the Doppler, Fredonag, and Roberts model in which there is this uh, operator but still you don't have a notion of distance between your points, okay? So the framework I would like to talk about is another approach to non-commutative geometry, which is the one developed by uh, Kohn, in which uh, the idea is not so much to say we will make the coordinate no longer commutating, but it is something more uh, abstract in a way, and the idea is to generalize the duality, which is well known uh, from uh, Gelfand, which is a duality at the topological level, which say that uh, locally compact topological spaces are the same things as uh, unital commutative sister algebra. Okay, the idea that if you know uh, you've got a lo locally compact topological space, you can look at the algebra of function defined on it, and this is the commutative algebra because the product of function uh, is just a product of numbers. And if you impose, so, so to any locally compact topological space, you can associate a commutative algebra. If it is compact, the algebra is a unit. And you can see that there is a sister algebra condition, which is a condition on the norms. I will not enter the detail. And the interesting uh, thing is it goes the other way around. If you start from an algebra which is unital and sister and commutative, then you can build a locally compact topological space such that this algebra you have begin with is actually the algebra function on your topological space. Even if you do not assume it from the beginning, you just take a commutative algebra which satisfies this property. But one is able to build uh, a topological space such that this algebra is actually the algebra of function. So this is well known uh, from uh, the beginning of the, well, in the middle, I don't know exactly the, when it is, but Gelfand, I mean, it's early of the, of the 90s, of the uh, 20th century, or is it? Okay. Anyway, it's an old result. Uh, and what is a, the, the, the program of Cohn has been to extend this duality Bayon topology, and uh, in a way to encompass all the aspects of Riemannian geometry. So not only uh, topology, but also all the aspects uh, of geometry, and in particular the distance, okay? So the metric aspect. So this is what I would like to, to explain. 
And the fact that, uh, as we have already heard before, all this, uh, let's say the full machinery worked very well for Riemannian geometry, but not for pseudo Riemannian geometry, because there are some, um, basically some problems of the fact that if you take the, the Hilbert space, the space of, uh, of square root integrable function on a Lorentzian manifold, it is not an Hilbert space, so you are losing many uh, important property of, uh, of functional analysis on Hilbert spaces, which are crucial to make all the, all the work, all, all the program of code work. But especially, there are some uh, work on this uh, non-Lorentzian, of this Lorentzian setting, which is, let's say, there is not a full theory of uh, non-commutative Lorentzian geometry, but in particular, if you look at the geometric aspect, then there are very nice work that have been made from various people, some of them are in, uh, are in this conference, so Walter Moretti, uh, Nicola Franco, that you have uh, heard before. Also, yeah, sorry, I made a, made a mistake. It's not Michel Broshana, it's Michel Eckstein, also, that you have heard before. And it's Mingosi. So they have, uh, let's say, worked, uh, elaborate on the formula of the distance that I will introduce after, the, the one of cone, and they managed to make, to give a kind of analogous of this uh, algebraic formulation of the distance in the Lorentzian setting. So the Lorentzian distance can be expressed in a formula which look like the formula of cone. But okay, uh, why I say it, there is not a full theory of Lorentzian non commutative geometry, because there are two aspects that, for the moment, are not, do not exist in the Lorentzian setting. Well, there is this reconstruction theorem that I will also explain, which basically tells you that the Riemannian geometry is the same thing as some algebraic data, which is called a spectral triple. In the Lorentzian setting, we don't yet have uh, this reconstruction theorem. So we can characterize the Lorentzian distance, but there is not so far a way to characterize purely algebraically uh, any Lorentzian manifold. And from the perspective, this, let's say, more the perspective of mathematics. From the perspective of physics, why all this also has some interest? Because there is a, a formula for an action, which is called the spectral action, and if you apply it to a given precise uh, model of non-commutative geometry, there is a description of the standard model of elementary particles in this framework. That was the big, uh, I mean, the big interest of all this model of cone to high energy physics. And let's say that there is a nice uh, part that the Higgs field uh, appears as a connection one form, uh, but a connection that lives in the non-commutative part of the geometry. So exactly as the other gauge boson, you don't have to put the Higgs field by hand because you want to generate a mass, but you obtain it from mathematical reason as a gauge, uh, as a connection one form. And this spectral action also, there is so far no, uh, no version in the Lorentzian setting, okay? So, so let me so give a bit more detail. So what is this idea of non-commutative geometry? Uh, I will focus on the notion of distance. So this is a, a distance which is defined between states of an algebra. And if you, also to connect to the talk we have heard before, if you are in the commutative case, the states of an algebra are probability distribution on your manifold. So basically we will talk about distance between probability distribution, okay? But in a more abstract level, so we will talk about state of an algebra. And for, if the algebra is commutative, Okay, so for instance, the algebra of function of a manifold, this distance actually is related to a distance in optimal transport, which is called uh, the Wasserstein distance of order one, okay, which is well known in optimal transport. And actually, it is Mark Riffel who noticed that long ago at the very beginning of non-commutative geometry. He noticed that the formula of cone that I will introduce after actually is the dual formulation of the Wasserstein distance, which is due to Kantorovich, which is also another well-known result in optimal transport. There is two ways to express the distance, okay? The Wasserstein distance, which is an infimum, and there is a dual version, which is a supremum. And actually what Riffel has noticed is that the formula of Kohn is exactly the Kantorovich, oops, the Kantorovich dual formulation of the distance, okay? And now the question that uh, I, I would like to answer in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this talk is, so the Wasserstein distance is an infimum. And it is in the optimal transport ID, it is defined by minimizing the cost. And the uh, Kantorovich formula is the supremum, and there is this interpretation in economics that you are not minimizing the cost, but you are maximizing the profit, okay? And the idea is that, uh, we wonder with Francesco D'Andrea was, uh, what happens if we are in the non-commutative setting? So we've got the formula of Kohn, which is a supremum, but do we have a version, a dual version of an infimum? Or pre-dual, if you think that the Wasserstein distance is before Kantorovich dual, or if we don't want to, to play with pre-dual because it's not clear that then we can go back. So let's say a dual version. So we've got the formula of the distance of the supremum. And we would like to know if there is a way to express this distance in the non-commutative framework as an infimum. And basically it means that we should define a, a notion of cost on a non-commutative setting. And uh, okay, so that's the, the two questions. So 
let me uh, say briefly how I uh, would like to proceed. So I will first recall uh, very briefly, very roughly, what is non-commutative geometry. So the main, um, the main object is this notion of spectral triple that we have heard already before. Then I will see how the distance is defined. And also I will give some recording of this distance of optimal transport. So apparently these two things uh, are unrelated and we will see that in a precise setting in the, non in the commutative setting, it works. Then we will go to the non-commutative setting and try to see if we can uh, play this dual game. So we got a distance at the supremum and try to see if we can find the cost and find the distance of coin as an infimum. So we will see there are, we have to work a little bit. We can make an attempt, uh, which seems natural. It works well on some example, but there is a very easy counter example. So it doesn't work that well. And we will see that the answer that it is, so this paper that we've made with uh, Francesco D'Andrea um, like two years ago, I think. Uh, it is a bit more complicated, but there is another, uh, for those who know well optimal transport, and I must say I'm not at all an expert of optimal transport, okay? I'm just learning it by doing this. There is a third, there is another dual formulation. There is a Wasserstein distance. There is a dual which is counter of it, but there is another dual which is called the Beckman's uh, formula. Uh, and actually what we found that the formula of Cohn is exactly, uh, uh, there is a, um, we can find a dual formulation which is exactly the Beckman formulation of optimal transport, which works also in the non-commutative setting. Once I have said that, I will not be able to say more because uh, I'm very, I'm learning what is this Beckman formulation. So um, we've got this result. I don't know what we can do with it, but still it's nice uh, to have it. Okay, so let me start. So very briefly, just to, to fix notation, basically, uh, what is, how do we describe so this uh, non-commutative geometry? The idea is that by uh, Gelfand duality, it's all contained in the algebra, okay? So the algebra gives you the topology. If you want more information than the, to than the topology, if you want all the, the geometric information of a Riemannian geometry, you need more than an algebra. So we'll have an algebra that will give you the topology, but this algebra will act on an Hilbert space, and there is an operator, D, which acts on this Hilbert space, and they must satisfy the set of properties, in particular, the commutator of this operator with any element of the algebra is bounded. The operator has a compact resolvent if the algebra is a unit, or there is this condition in case the algebra is non-unital. So I will not give all the details, but what is the main uh, result? So this reconstruction theorem of Cohn, which actually has been announced in 96, but uh, it has been proven uh, only later, so in 2008. And it tells you the following thing. So if you start, if you've got a compact Riemannian manifold M, then you can associate to it a spectral triple. You just take the algebra of smooth function on this manifold, so it is a commutative algebra. You act with this algebra on the space, on the space of uh, square integrable differential forms. So this is this space here. So just like multiplication, you take a differential form and you multiply it by a function, and this is still a differential form. And this operator D is, uh, here D, uh, small d is the exterior derivative, and okay, this is a signature operator for those who are familiar with this. So it is the exterior derivative plus the adjoint of this operator. And here the adjoint is defined because you've got, um, you take the adjoint of a form, which is uh, the Hodge uh, dual of this. And so you associate to this uh, uh, notion of self-adjointness. And uh, this is this operator here, okay? So the signature operator, uh, which acts also on the, on the space of uh, integrable, square integrable forms and the algebra of smooth function commutative which acts on this. And this, uh, these three elements satisfy the set of axioms. So there are seven, uh, actually five property which are quite technical, so I will not list them. And that's okay. Now what is the interesting uh, part is the other way around, okay? Is that if you start with a spectral triple AHD where A is an algebra commutative, is a commutative algebra, H, which acts on the Hilbert space, D is an operator, and they satisfied this condition plus the other five axioms, okay? Then uh, what Kohn has shown that there is, uh, one can build a, Riemann, a compact Riemannian manifold such that this algebra you have started with is actually the algebra of smooth function on the manifold, okay? So this is in this sense that it extends Gelfand duality. Gelfand duality is between commutative algebra and uh, locally compact topological space. Here you've got a duality between spectral triple with algebra commutative and Riemannian uh, manifold, compact Riemannian manifold. Uh, okay, so uh, just to say, because in, for those who are more interested in physics, actually there exists also a version of this for spin manifold, which is the one which is used in the application to, to the standard model. And in that case, you replace uh, the differential form by the spinors, the square integrable spinors, and your operator, instead of the signature operator, you take the Dirac operator of quantum field theory, so this notation which is used. Okay, so 
that's uh, the global framework. Now, uh, what is the distance? So you first we define uh, that the algebra is commutative or not. We uh, can consider is the space of states of this algebra. So which is written here, H of A, state of A. Uh, what are states? A state is uh, just a normalized uh, is a map from the algebra to the complex number. If uh, the algebra is complex, there is also a version for real numbers, but it's a little bit more delicate. So it's a linear map from the algebra to the complex number, which is normalized. So it means that the identity of the algebra is mapped to one, which is positive. So it means that the algebra is a star algebra. So there is a notion of positive elements, which are all the product A star A, where A is an element of the algebra. And the positive elements are mapped to, uh, to real numbers, okay? And so the states are exactly are just this set of linear map, so positive and uh, normalized. And you can define the distance in this way. So you take two states, C and C, phi and phi, phi tilde, and you evaluate these states on the element of the algebra. You take the absolute value of, Z, of this, you take the supremum of all the elements of the algebra, which satisfy this condition with respect to the operator that entered in the definition of the sector triple. So the condition is that the commutator of an element of the algebra with this uh, operator should have a norm which is smaller than one. And one can check that this defines the distance between this space of states. And what happened that if you look at the commutative case, so if you take the algebra of a compact Riemannian manifold and you take for D the signature operator or the, the Dirac operator, what you find that first, what are the pure states? Oh, it's okay. You know that the space of states uh, for a um, Newton sister algebra is a convex uh, set. So you can look at the extremal points, which are the pure states, okay? So if you look at the pure state of the algebra of, uh, of smooth function on the manifold, this is exactly the point of the manifold. Okay, the idea is that a point of a manifold, you can view it as an object which acts on a function to give you a number. It gives you the x, if you take the, it's the, the evaluation, okay? So you, you consider the points are evaluation. So a point acts on a function to give you the value of the function evaluated on this point. And if you take this point of view, so the pure state of the algebra of uh, a smooth function on the manifold are precisely uh, the point of the manifold. And if you compute the distance of cone, so between two pure states, so the evaluation at the point X and the evaluation at the point uh, Y of your, of, your, uh, of your manifold, you can compute the distance, so this formula which is here, either with the signature operator or if you are in a spin manifold with, um, with uh, the Dirac operator. And what you can show that you find back is the geodesic distance between the two points. We'll see just after why uh, it's not difficult at all to, to understand why. And from this point of view, so the, the distance of cone is, uh, let's say, non-commutative generalization of the distance, of the geodesic distance, if you consider it between pure states. The question is, yeah? Yeah, exactly. If you are in a commutative setting, this tells you that the function is a leaf shift. Okay, so that's why it works, actually. Uh, okay. Uh, so the question is, uh, what happened now this, for the distance between non-pure states? So even in the commutative setting, this is an interesting question. I mean, if I don't consider point, but I consider non-pure state. So a non-pure state is a probability distribution on my manifold in the commutative setting. So what happened to, what, what is this distance? I mean, it is a distance on the space of state that you can show it in very general. So it satisfies all the properties. So what it is in the, uh, for non-pure state. And this is here that there is a link with uh, optimal transport. So. I uh, open a parenthesis. Uh, what is this, distance, this Wasserstein distance? An optimal transport. So you start from a locally compact Polish state X uh, in which there is a cost function which is defined. So it is a positive function which takes two points and gives you a positive number. So it gives you the cost to move from X to Y, okay? And, uh, well, okay, you probably know, well, you know this better than me. Uh, what is, uh, we define the work to transport a probability measure mu one to a probability measure mu two, which is defined in this way. So you take the integration of this cost function, which is a function of two variables. So you integrate of all the measure on x time x for the measure pi, such that the, uh, the marginal of this uh, measure are the two uh, measure, uh, the one we start with and the one where we want to arrive for mu one and mu two. So this is called in the, in the framework of uh, optimal transport, this is called the transportation plans. Okay, and uh, the point that if the cost function is a distance, then, which is not obligatory, I mean, you can have a cost function which is not a distance, but if the cost function has the property of a distance function, then uh, one can show that this 
uh, optimal transport is a distance between probability measure. Okay, and this is what is called the uh, Wasserstein distance of order one. Usually people, it seems that in optimal transport, people prefer to work with a distance of order two. So of order two, you take the integral of the, of the square of the cost and you take the square root of all z. But it turned out that in non-commutative geometry, it's not a choice. I mean, that's a fact that the distance which uh, is relevant is a, is a distance of order one. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is a distance. Okay, strictly speaking, it can be infinite. So it's, do not call it a distance, but let me allow me, no, please allow me this uh, uh, use of language. So I will call distance even if it is possibly infinite. So it is a distance on the space of probability measure uh, to the Wasserstein distance of order one. So what uh, Riffel has noticed that actually the distance of cone is exactly uh, this Wasserstein distance in the commutative case. Actually, uh, Riffel assume uh, that the manifold was compact and with Francesco, we just a few, just a small generalization that the manifold actually uh, only need to be complete, connected with a boundary. And in that case, the Wasserstein distance between probability measure is the distance of cone between pure states. Between non between states between non pure states, sorry. Uh, and what is the cost? The cost is precisely the, geodes the geodesic distance. Okay, and uh, the spectral triple that we use is this one. Yeah, there is some variation because if the since the manifold is not is complete, but we do not assume that it is compact. Uh, you should uh, the algebra that one should use is the algebra of smooth function, which have a compact uh, compact super. So why? How does it work? Well, it's not very difficult. If you take the Kantorovich duality version of the Wasserstein distance, so the Wasserstein distance is an infimum here, and Kantorovich has shown that this is the same thing as taking the supremum of the integral of Lipschitz function uh, with respect to the measure that defines the probability distribution, okay? And there is this uh, condition is that the function are one Lipschitz with respect to the cost. In our case, the cost is the geodesic distance. So that's Kantorovich duality. If you look at the version of Cohn, Actually, you find it's not difficult to see that the commutator of the signature operator with a function, and if you take the norm of this, this is precisely the Lipschitz norm of the function, okay? Uh, so you see that the two formula are almost the same, except that in the Kantorovich duality, uh, you are looking the supremum on all the uh, function that, that uh, no, on all the function Lipschitz, you do not assume that they vanish uh, at infinity. In the formula of Cohn, we have the algebra of function which are compactly supported, but this is a technical point and this can be solved because whatever one Lipschitz function which does not vanish at infinity, we can approximate it by uh, this one Lipschitz function which are continuous and vanish at infinity. And again, this one we can approximate by uh, one Lipschitz function which are smooth and compactly supported, so which are element here. So this shows that in the commutative setting, the distance of cone is exactly the Wasserstein distance of order one between pure state and between non-pure state. So, uh, sorry, I, yeah, okay. So let me so summarize again what we would like to do. So in the commutative case, we've got the distance of cone that here I call the spectral distance, and by Kantorovich duality, this is the Wasserstein distance where the cost is precisely uh, the distance between pure states. Now, if we go to the non-commutative case. We've got the formula of cone, which is a supremum. So it's a kind of analogous of the Kantorovich duality, but we would like to go back in the other way around. So can we find a version of the Wasserstein distance on the space of states where, uh, with a given cost, okay? So why we would like to do this? Why? Because since it exists in the commutative setting, we'd like, okay, what can we do of this duality in the non-commutative setting? Does it, is it dead or is there somehow a way that we can, can do it? And also there is a, but this is more my personal uh, dream, which actually will not work. But uh, as I said, there is a non-commutative geometry. If you look at the application to high energy physics, there is a, a very nice thing that the Higgs field appears naturally as a connection one form. And actually, if you compute the distance in this uh, spectral triple for relevant for the standard model, you can give a metric interpretation to the Higgs field. I mean, we have already heard this idea that there is a model of space time with two phi, okay? And if you apply this distance, actually the distance between the two levels of space-time are precisely given by the Higgs field, okay? And so there was this idea that if it works, if we can make uh, a duality back with a cost function, it would give a way to interpret the Higgs field as a cost function on some on space-time, which would be, well, maybe not interesting, but would be quite a nice interpretation and at least an original interpretation of the Higgs field. So how can we try to make sense of this duality in the non-commutative case? We observe that 
what would be the cost in the non-commutative setting? If you look in the commutative case, assume you've got the Wasserstein distance. How can you find back the cost function? You just evaluate the Wasserstein distance between pure states. Okay, if you look at the formula of the Wasserstein distance, it gives you precisely the cost. So we can say, okay, let's do that. In the non-commutative case, we've got the distance, which makes sense between states, pure or not. So we could say, let's define the cost on our non-commutative framework as the distance between pure states. And from this, we built a Wasserstein distance and look, uh, and we try to see if this Wasserstein distance coincide with the cone distance between non-pure states. That would be the kind of natural uh, path to, to follow. So we can do it, but there are some difficulties. First, when we are in the non-commutative setting and we say we would like to define the cost between pure state and then compute uh, the distance between non-pure state associated to this cost, it works only if the pure state are probability distribution, sorry, only if the non-pure states are probability distribution on the pure state. This is, a, this is true in the commutative case, okay? The pure state are the point and the non-pure state is a probability distribution. But in the non-commutative setting, it may not be true that a state is a probability distribution on the pure state. So actually, uh, some people told me it's always true, but what I found in, uh, in some books, Bratelli Robinson, for those who know, that uh, it works if the algebra can be non-commutative, it has to be a sister algebra, unital and separable. There is this separable condition. And in that case, one can show that if actually uh, a non-pure state is a probability, one can associate to a non-pure state a probability distribution on the states of pure states. Okay, so I've written here, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, actually, I've got the doubts now. Uh, uh, I should check. <laughs> because I, I mean, that's a condition. I, actually, I'm, I just took it from the Bratelli Robinson book. I, okay, they say because it has to be made quizable. And so the separable here means that the space of state is made quizable. And so you can associate to them a probability distribution. But so you have to check if this is in the algebraic setting or in the topological uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now how do we define a, a state? Uh, so it is a probability, associate a probability distribution which leave who, who knew uh, this probability distribution. So lived on the space of pure states, P of A. And uh, so the evaluation of a non-pure state, an element of the algebra, we just take the integration of, uh, of the pure state, of uh, a, a k hat of omega here, it's just a notation to say that, I mean, this is the idea to say that uh, an, element of the algebra, uh, an element of the algebra is a kind of non-commutative function or on our space of uh, pure state. Okay, so we take this non-commutative function evaluated on the pure state, but how we define this evaluation is just the pure state evaluated on the element of the algebra. Okay, this is just a notation, but to mimic what happened in the commutative case. In the commutative case, omega will be a point, P of A will be the manifold, here this will be a probability measure on your manifold, and this will be a function evaluated on the point. On the non-commutative setting, we make something analogous. And we can define uh, the Wasserstein distance associated to this cost function. We just take uh, for any uh, two pure states, any two states, sorry, we take the probability distribution, uh, mu one, mu two, we take the integral on uh, all the measure on the, on the space of states, Cartesian product with itself, all the measure which have uh, this mu one, I mean, uh, the measure corresponding to phi and phi tilde as a marginal. So this is exactly the formula of the Wasserstein distance. The problem that uh, two probability distribution on the pure state may be different that correspond to the same state. Okay, in the commutative setting, no. I mean, if you've got two different probability distribution, they define two different probability distribution. In the non-commutative setting, uh, this is not true. For instance, we will see an example. If you take the algebra of two by two matrices, the pure state are a sphere, and the non-pure state is the ball. But the fact that any element of the ball, you can decompose it as a, a, a convex linear combi combination of two points, but there are many different possibilities. You take two uh, diametrally opposite points, and it gives you the same uh, point in the ball. Okay, so this is exactly the problem. So the space of state of, uh, in the non-commutative setting is not equal to the space of probability measure on pure state, it is a quotient of this thing. So if you compute this distance here, if we take two probability distribution different but which correspond to the same state, this integral here may be non-zero. But it should be zero because if it is the same state, we want this to be a distance. So the distance between two states should be zero. So this formula cannot work. It is not a distance. Oh, sorry, this one, uh, yeah. This one is not a distance, okay? Because if mu and mu tilde 
have uh, defined the same state phi, then if we compute this quantity here between mu and mu field, which are dis distinct, we may find something non-zero, but here we would like to find something between zero. So this doesn't work. So the possibility is to take the minimum, for instance, of this quantity on all the, uh, the possible uh, probability distribution that correspond to the state. In that case, if I take the same state, I will find that the minimum is when I take the same probability distribution and give me zero. So the problem that even this quantity may not be uh, distant because it is not clear that it satisfies the triangular inequality, okay? Actually, I haven't checked really. Maybe it works, but I, I don't think so. So the, the fact that really uh, mimicking this ID is not, uh, does not work. So we change the ID and, uh, and we take the following, uh, the following way with, uh, with Francesco. So the idea is to say, assume that there is an optimal transport on our space of pure state. We don't know how to define the Wasserstein distance exactly, but assume there is one. And somehow the contour of duality should work again. And if the contour of duality works, it means that if we've got uh, an optimal transport on our space of pure state with the cost, uh, the distance of cone between pure state, and it scales the distance, which still have to be fine, on the space of state. If we follow Kantorovich ID, we should have a dual formulation, which would be this thing here. So it's exactly the same as before. We, we take the state, we evaluate it on an element of the algebra, we take the supremum on all the elements of the algebra, which are lead sheets with respect to the cost function. Okay, that's the formula uh, of Kantorovich. But in our case, we are changing the notion of Lipschitz. Lipschitz means that, uh, I mean, our cost function is a distance. So we are looking for element of the algebra such that when we evaluate it on two distinct states, this should be uh, smaller than uh, the cost function, which in our case is the distance of cone between pure states. So we arrive to this notion of Lipschitz element. And if we do this, uh, by construction, this Wasserstein distance coincide with the cost function on pure state, so with the distance of cone. So we've got a distance which between pure state corresponds to the distance of cone. Now the question is this distance between non-pure state, does it correspond to the distance of cone? And the answer, what you can show uh, very easily that the distance of cone between non-pure state is uh, always smaller or equal to this Wasserstein distance. Here there is a condition Y, but I will not enter the details. And what we can show that it works, the two are equal, but only, um, they are equal in a particular case, which is precisely when we take uh, two uh, pure states and we take all the states which are linear combination of these two pure states. Okay, so we take like a, a array in the space of state, which fits two pure states. We take all the convex linear combination of this. And on this ray, so the two states which are uh, here, uh, phi lambda, so it's given by omega one and omega two are fixed. We take phi lambda as lambda omega one plus one minus lambda omega two. This is a non-pure state. And if we compute the distance between two state like that, so which corresponds to the same omega one and omega two, but different value of lambda, we find that in that case, the distance of cone is exactly this distance of uh, Kantorovich, let's say non-commutative distance. But okay, it's very restricted because <laughs> we are just considering algebra such that the space of state is given by, uh, can always be decomposed as uh, two pure states. So where does it work? So a very basic example, you just take as an algebra, which is commutative, but still it is interesting, you take the algebra, uh, C2, so two complex number, which acts on uh, the Hilbert space C2 just by a diagonal uh, matrix, okay? So an element of the algebra is given by two complex numbers, zeta one, zeta two. You make them act on the Hilbert space C2 just by diagonal matrices, and here you take as an operator uh, just a half diagonal matrix. And if you apply the formula of cone of the distance, you find that your space has two pure states, okay? So each pure state is uh, the the evaluation of the, of the pair of complex numbers. So the first pure state gives you the first complex number, the second pure state gives you the second complex number. And you find that the distance between these two pure states is just one over the coefficient, which is here in, the, in your operator. And if uh, now you look at the non-pure state, well, the non-pure state are always combination of these two pure states. So the formula that we have seen before works. And so the distance of cone between non-pure state is exactly this uh, contour of each non-commutative distance. Okay, this is, not very interesting, just to check in a very simple example that it works. Uh, an example a bit less simple, which is nice, are uh, the two by two matrices. This time it is, commut it, is, uh, it is non-commutative. And the fact that the space of states of this algebra are uh, the ball. So here I have written how it works. So because the state of an algebra of a matrix, a two by two matrix, you can do it as a, for those who prefer the notation of quantum mechanics, you add with a, a bracket of a, 
uh, on the matrix, or you can also see that it is a trace with a density matrix, okay? And there is this uh, well-known um, apparent utilization, and you can show that any states of uh, this algebra, you can map it to, uh, to this formula to the ball, okay? To the ball of radius one. And actually, a non-pure state is a probability uh, defined by your probability density, no, sorry, the pure state has mapped to the sphere, S2, and the non-pure state is defined by your probability measure on S2, but actually depends only on the barycenter of, uh, of this probability measure. So this is here that we've got the quotient, okay? The, the space of state of the algebra of two by two matrices is not the probability distribution on the sphere, because the probability distribution on the sphere, this would be the pure state of the algebra of commutative function on the sphere. Here we've got the algebra of two by two matrices. So it is, uh, so any state, any state is defined by a probability measure, but what uh, matters are the, are the, um, the very center of this probability measure. So give you a point in the ball. Uh, so you can, okay, yeah, some details. You can compute the distance. And here I've plotted two examples. So it depends now of your spectral triple that you associate to the two sphere. Okay, you can take the algebra of two by two matrices. You can act on, uh, on C2, okay, just the usual action of matrices. And you take as a Dirac operator any two by two matrix, uh, which has non-zero eigenvalue D1 on D2. And if you compute the distance of cone, you find that, so you got a distance on the, on the ball, and uh, there is an orientation of the ball, so a north pole and a south pole, which are given by the eigenvector of uh, your operator here. Basically, the north pole is one eigenvector, the south pole is another one, and you find that the distance is the Euclidean distance on the sphere if you take two points which are at the same uh, parallel, okay? And the distance is infinite if you take two states which are on this ring parallel, okay? You can make this computation. Uh, here, I've something more complicated, but just to say that um, there are many, if you start from an algebra, there are many different ways of building a spectral triple. Here, there is one which is more complicated, which comes from, you make the two by two matrices act on the space of two by two matrices tensor C2, and there is this complicated operator here. Just to say, this comes from uh, a quantum um, version of quantum space, which is called the Moyle space. So you can, uh, it is a kind of space that I introduced at the beginning where the coordinates no longer commute. If nu is nu, is it equal to a constant? So here's this defined an algebra and you can associate it to it a spectral triple. And actually you can uh, then uh, restrict the spectral triple to two by two matrices because actually it's a spectral triple on infinite dimensional matrices. But if you can the restriction, if you take the restriction to two by two matrices, you arrive to this action here, which is complicated. And the nice part of this, you can compute the distance again, and you find that now uh, the distance is a formula here, which is a bit more complicated, but it's no longer infinite between uh, points on a different parallel. So it is a way to make the sphere, the distance on the sphere by non-commutative geometry finite uh, in any case. And in both cases, so this works. The distance of cone is this Wasserstein uh, Kantorovich non-commutative distance. But there is a counterexample, very simple. Uh, if you take an algebra which has three, uh, pure state, so you just take the algebra three, uh, C3, okay? Which act on C3 by diagonal matrices, the same as before, okay? And uh, the, the Dirac operator, this is an example uh, by Riffel, okay? As a Dirac operator, as an operator, you take this one, and if you compute the distance, you find, uh, well, you find something, and if you compute the distance of cone, so between uh, any uh, non-pure state, so non-pure state, I can, uh, we can parameterize them in this way. So there are convex linear combination of the three pure state, delta one, delta two, delta three. So for any states, we need two numbers, lambda one, lambda two. And since uh, it is a convex linear combination, the third coefficient is one minus lambda one minus lambda two. We take another state with other different, different numbers, lambda prime one, lambda prime two. Uh, we define this big capital lambda one, which is the difference between these two numbers, okay? And if you compute the distance of cone, you find this formula here. And if you compute our quantitative version of a uh, Kantorovich version, we find these things here. So you see that the two things are not the same in a very simple example. So the fact that we've got three distant pure states make that the thing doesn't work. It works when we just have two pure states on the sphere on the, of C2, but on C3, it doesn't work. So, uh, which basically kills our idea and to say, okay, it doesn't seem to be that there is a cost that we can systematically associate it with the distance of cone. So now come, I will go fast on this. Uh, the result that we have to obtain with Francesco a couple of years ago, which actually comes, it has been inspired because there are some people who are making uh, what is called a quantum optimal transport. And they are working with this kind of thing, but on matrix algebra. And there is a paper, uh, I copied it here, no, okay. 
data for the people. Uh, they make a kind of dual version of the formula of cone for matrix algebra, and basically we, we follow their idea and we make it more general, and it works in the following way. So it's a bit more uh, abstract. Uh, when you take your operator, so I call it the Dirac operator in general, so it's operator of a spectral tuple, you can uh, show that you define what is called a derivation. So derivation is a map from the algebra to a given B module, to be technique, the B module which is generated by this operator. Okay, so just given in this way. And this, by, uh, by the condition of a spectral tuple, this, any element of this B module is uh, bounded on the Hilbert space, because there is this condition that A is a bounded element of the algebra, and an important condition for spectral tuple that this commutator should be bounded for any element of the algebra. So this is an element in the Hilbert space. And if you take any uh, subspace of the bounded elements of your Hilbert space that contain the image of this uh, derivation, and you take its Banach dual, okay, uh, which is a set of uh, linear functional from this uh, bounded operator to C with this norm here, and you can consider the pullback of this derivation, which is defined in this way, so the pullback of a derivation, is a linear map from the algebra to the complex number that we write in this way, okay, which is defined through the usual pullback formula. And what you can show that if you take two states of your algebra, uh, you assume that they are at finite spectral distance from one another, then you can define this formula here. So you take uh, the norm of uh, this uh, element in the Banyard dual such that the pullback of this, uh, of this element is the difference between the two states. And you take the norm of this, and uh, you take the, sorry, the norm of this, you look at the infimum of all the elements whose pullback is the difference of the two states. This expression is well defined, and you find that the infimum is a minimum. It does not depend on the choice of the, of the subset that contains the image of the derivation. You can take a big one or a small one. What is important is that it contains the image of the derivation. And you find that this thing here is exactly the distance of cone between non pure states. So it is a dual formula because now the distance is an infimum, whereas the distance of cone was a supremum. So we've got a dual formula, but there is no cost. I mean, it is a kind of complicated stuff. So it takes a pullback of uh, a map which should be the difference of the two states. So there is no longer cost, and it doesn't seem to be related to uh, optimal transport. And this is where we uh, the ignorance of optimal transport and, okay, something is also not important. Actually, if you look at this formula in the case of uh, the Euclidean space Rn, okay, you can okay write uh, what is uh, the pullback. I mean, uh, this is an element in the dual of uh, of B of H, which are given by a Radon measure here, and here this uh, we are in the case of Spino, so there is a gamma matrices. And if you look at the side condition, so that the, the pullback of this uh, element in the Banach dual should be the difference of the two states, you can write it in this way, and with a bit of work, you arrive to this thing here, okay? And this is precisely, uh, you arrive basically that the formula we have shown, you arrive to this formula here, which for those who know, is precisely what is called this Beckman formulation of the optimal transport, okay? Uh, okay, so this is Beckman formula for, I don't, Again, uh, this Beckman formulation, I know basically nothing about it, except that it is this formula here. For what I read, the idea is not to uh, minimize the cost, but it's more related to problem in optimal transport, which they say are dynamical. So you've got a dynamical process and you try to make something optimal. And there is this, uh, so this distance that appears. And what is true that in the commutative case, this, uh, this distance between probability measure is again a dual of the Vachot time distance with the cost of the GBZ function. So in the commutative case, there are, so far as I know, uh, two duality. There is a Vachot time distance, which is an infimum, and there is two dual possibility. The Kantorovich, which is a supremum, you maximize the cost. And, uh, no, sorry, the, there is a Kantorovich formula, which is a supremum, and if there is two dual uh, versions, which are an infimum, there is a Vachot time original distance, and there is this one. Uh, historically, I'm not an expert, maybe, I don't know which one comes first, but okay. So there is this two duality, and all this, the three things are equal. What we have obtained that in the commutative, in the non-commutative setting, uh, so the spectral distance is a generalization of the Kantorovich formula, but uh, if we want to look at the dual of this formula, uh, so we should not look at the Wasserstein distance because this doesn't work. There is a counterexample with a very simple algebra, C to the three, but there is this Beckman formula, and the formula of Cohn is really, is exactly admits, I mean, the, as a dual formulation, this formula of Beckman. Uh, okay, so this is uh, just summarized. So the idea, why is this, why is this interesting? 
uh, when you want to compute the formula of cone, uh, it is a supremum. So it is very easy to have um, a lower bound because you take any element that satisfies the condition with uh, the operator and it gives you a lower, lower bound. The problem is to find the upper lower bound. That's the difficulty. If you got a formula as an infimum, it is the other way around. As an infimum, it is easy to have an upper bound, but what is difficult to find the lowest upper bound. And the idea is that if we've got the two formula, using one, we can find upper bound, using the other one, we find the lower bound, and hopefully, uh, they converge and we find the distance. The problem that, how do you compute this stuff? Because it's complicated, how do you find uh, this uh, dual element whose pullback through the derivation as a difference of the state? I don't, what we have tried, it doesn't seem that operationally it is very tractable, but okay, at least we, I talk to this because in Genova there are some people working on optimal consort and say, no, come on, this Beckman's formula is, uh, is something interesting. So it's not, uh, you should be optimistic that it could be interesting to have, uh, to have this formulation there. Okay, and I will stop here, so thank you. Here, so it's some uh, reference. <laughs>